Hello and welcome back to a new video on this channel. Today I will explain five of the most common misconceptions in the skiing community. These kinds of beliefs are often based on traditions and not necessarily physiology. In this video, I will explain why they are wrong. Myth number five, cool downs and recovery sessions. Many traditionalists in the skiing community will tell you that doing some easy physical activity after hard sessions or races is important because it should reduce the recovery time. The last decade, there has been lots of research on this topic and the conclusions are crystal clear. Cool downs do not reduce the recovery time. If anything, it creates more fatigue and increases the recovery time even more. This idea is just based on old beliefs and has no root in physiology. It doesn't make any sense either that doing even more work when you're already tired should reduce the recovery time. When the session is over, get home and relax because that's what's gonna make you recover the fastest. When you're done after a hard session, your body isn't as receptive to training either, so you won't get much in return from the half an hour of easy work, even from a training perspective. Next, recovery sessions. Where to start? Listen. Training is training and recovery is recovery. No training will improve recovery. You should do low intensity training, but do not believe it is for recovery. All training will have a cost and require recovery time afterwards. The words active recovery or recovery sessions shouldn't exist. So these two myths were merged into one chapter and a common term for them could be junk volume. They're both just a waste of energy creates unnecessary fatigue without any physiological benefits and do not improve performance and end therefore up in the category of junk volume. Myth number four, endurance-based strength training and misconceptions about strength training. The next one on this list is about the old school way of training strength in the skiing community, where the common ideas are, you should do extremely low resistance and high rep work to improve your endurance. You should only train strength with your own body weight as soon as you add weights into your program, it becomes dangerous and you will for sure get injured, and it might also stunt your growth. Strength training makes you heavier. And finally, the only muscle groups you're allowed to train are the abs and the lower back. Now we will go through these statements and I will explain why they are wrong. Endurance training is what skiers are doing every day in their regular training. To achieve the adaptation of improved muscular endurance, you need a high volume and having sessions with a significant duration. If you do extremely low weights and high rep sets, even if the total work time of the sets was as much as three minutes, it's still not even close to achieving the adaptation of an increase in mitochondria, capillaries, and aerobic enzymes. The only consequences of this are extreme muscle damage, soreness, and long recovery time. It will not increase the cross-sectional area because the resistance will be too low to achieve mechanical tension. It will not improve the maximal strength because the weights will be too low to get the neurological adaptations. And it will not influence the muscular endurance either because 80 seconds of work time is still not even close to actually stimulating the peripheral factors in the musculature. To train endurance when training strength is a terrible idea and is based more on traditions than anything else. There has been done research on high rep strength training in the context of endurance performance, like for example this study, which found no improvements on any of the critical variables. Training only with your own body weight will not result in a high enough neurological stimulus. You need a resistance in order to gain strength. By the way, the general level of knowledge about resistance training in the skiing community is tragically poor. This kind of circuit training with high reps and short breaks is not strength training, and it's not endurance training either. There has been lots of research on strength training and endurance performance over many years. The conclusions based on research done on runners, cyclists, rowers, etc. are clear. High weight, low rep strength training, which leads to an increase in 1RM, done in exercises that have a similar movement pattern as the specific sport, improves the work economy, or you're simply getting more speed out of the same aerobic capacity. Studies on runners show improvements in the cost of travel from between 3 and 7%. There hasn't been much research on cross-country skiers, and there are mixed results from these few studies, but based on the data from the other endurance sports, believing that it won't affect the performance at all would be strange when there is overwhelming evidence across all other endurance sports over decades of research. Strength is most effectively improved through heavy resistance, 
long breaks in between sets and maximum effort in a few reps. You shouldn't bring any endurance training principles into the strength room. Those two training forms are completely different and shouldn't be combined in any way at all. Furthermore, drastic increases in 1RM will mean all sub-maximal weights will become easier and you will become more enduring at lower weights. These traditionalists who are skeptical to strength training with weights are also often caught up in this idea that it will stunt your growth and result in injuries. These claims are not true, and if you look at injury statistics among athletes in different sports, the athletes who are involved in resistance training are actually one of the groups who have the least number of injuries. And the next one, that strength training makes you heavier. This is also total nonsense. Most of the strength gains will come through neurological adaptations and not through an increase in muscle volume, but even if the size did increase. Let's take the arms as an example. An average arm weighs roughly three to five kilograms. If you increase the cross-sectional area of the biceps with an X number of millimeters, and you do the same on the triceps, the actual water retention from this increase in muscle mass will only be marginal. Even a five centimeter increase in circumference probably won't contain more weight than 70 to 100 grams tops. You can multiply a certain number of grams by X amounts of muscle groups on the body, and you will realize that Getting heavier through strength training in a way that is really meaningful is nearly impossible. Calorie-dense food and caloric surplus over time, which lead to an increase in overall fat mass, are what makes you heavier, not whether you increase the cross-sectional area of your triceps and shoulders a little bit. And the last one. The only muscle groups you're allowed to train as a skier are the abs and the lower back. These muscle groups are of course important as a cross-country skier, and you definitely need to train them. But here's where many people get confused. The purpose of core training is not to improve the muscular endurance in that region, but to achieve better neuromuscular control, which will improve the prerequisites for effective technical solutions through better stability. The endurance is trained through actual skiing itself and not on the gym mat. A double polling stroke or a skate kick isn't only about the abs. Other muscle groups, such as the lats, the triceps, the quads, the hamstrings, etc., are also very active when skiing, so training only the abs and the lower back will not give you the best results. You should choose exercises with a similar movement pattern as skiing itself to achieve better neuromuscular efficiency in the movements that are transferable, and these exercises definitely involve more than just the abs and the lower back. Some people say they can't feel any transferability from maximal strength training to skiing. One of the reasons is because they think that strength is strength and it's kind of the same which exercises you do. This is not the case at all, and it only works if you're being super accurate and specific and choose exercises that are as close to skiing as possible. There is no such thing as endurance-based strength training. This term shouldn't even exist. Strength training is strength training and endurance training is endurance training. Those are two training forms that communicate poorly. They shouldn't be mixed in any way at all. Not in the same session. Do not perform strength training when you're tired after endurance training, and do not try to do this weird thing somewhere in between strength and endurance. That really is neither of them. Any exercise that doesn't use weights, a weight, a resistance of some sort, is not... No! You need to have a weight. You need to do real lifting. Next myth on the list. Versatility and being well-rounded is very important to ski fast. Many traditionalists in the skiing community will always talk up the importance of being well-rounded and taking part in many different physical activities to build this so-called base that should help performance in the specific discipline. What is important in cross-country skiing? Average speed is what matters, and average speed is greatly determined by the two main factors, the performance VO2 and the athlete's work economy. All training should be done with the goal of influencing either one or several of the critical factors. Which of these factors would you say basketball, football, and table tennis influence? The answer is none of them. The reality is versatility doesn't really help performance. 
The principle of specificity is by far the most important training principle. What you're training for is what you will become better at. It's that simple. As soon as you go outside the main training form, the transferability will become less and less the further you move away. Training forms with very similar physical demands like running and cycling can have a certain transferability, but that's only because it can increase the aerobic capacity, which indirectly can lead to a performance improvement. Having a certain variation within the few training forms that actually help can be a good idea. However, just because there is a certain transferability from these cousin-like sports doesn't mean you can do any physical activity and believe it will make you a faster cross-country skier. Training for cross-country skiing during summer and fall is primarily about roller skiing. A little cycling, running, and strength training on top of that. That's it. Don't waste time on training forms with zero transferability because you don't have an unlimited amount of time and energy. There is absolutely zero transferability from basketball to cross-country skiing. Top sports are about maximizing performance in one single discipline. It doesn't matter how well-rounded you are. What matters is how well you're able to perform in the one thing that matters. Devote the valuable energy where you get the most in return. Myth number two. It's impossible to increase VO2 max after the age of 20. Du har et vindu fra du er en, ja, 12-13 år. Selvfølgelig har du det. Og så er det rett kjempeheldig. For jeg tror det her er det man kaller den motoriske gullalderen, som gjør at hvis dere jobber, legger inn mye trening på kapasitet nå, så får du gjort ekstremt mye. Så mister man den perioden. Og skal jeg fortelle noe ferdig? Den perioden stopper nesten når man er 20 år. Så det man ikke har klart å gjøre med sitt eget ordsopptak frem til man er 20, det får man sannsynligvis ikke gjort en dritt med etter man har blitt 20. Man kan prøve å trene alle mulige varianter, men det viser seg... Jeg tok en otomåling da jeg var... Ok, så som du hørte, det er en ting som noen i den cross-country skiing community tror er riktig. Denne misunderstanding er kommet fra en lack av forståelse av fysiologi. Det er egentlig bare... You have a window from when you are between 12 and 20 years old where you can increase your maximal oxygen uptake a lot, and this window will close as soon as you're 20. So it's not possible to influence this physiological parameter after this specific age. The reason why many people come to this conclusion is because it has been observed over many years that many elite skiers struggle to increase their VO2 max in any meaningful way in their senior years, and because of this observation, they come to the conclusion that there must exist a so-called window that's closed. This is a huge misunderstanding, and I am going to explain why. The reason why many elite skiers struggle to increase their VO2 max as adults is because they've been training hard for many years already. So by the time they're around 19 to 20, many of them have already maxed out their genetic potential on maximal oxygen uptake, or they're very close to the genetic limit. Improving all physiological parameters gets exponentially harder the closer you get to your genetic potential. The reason why the trajectory slows down can be, one, because you're approaching your genetic potential, but it can also be because you're not prioritizing and investing enough time at high-intensity training to achieve progressive overload on this parameter. It's not about age. It's all about your genetic potential and how far off your own genetic limit you currently are. For a person who, for whatever reason, hasn't maximized his potential, there is no reason why the VO2 max can't be improved as an adult. Let's say you were sick or injured as a junior, so you didn't have the possibility to train with consistency. In this case, is it possible to increase your maximal oxygen uptake between the age of 20 and 30? It's absolutely possible. There have been many examples across the whole endurance field. Nicholas Deerhaug is a good example. He was injured during his junior period, but increased his capacity a lot in the subsequent years. The world record holder on many ski erg distances started training endurance randomly at the age of 32, with no background from endurance sports, and within a couple of years he became unstoppable on the cardio machines. There have been many other examples as well, like Primoz Roglic, who was a professional ski jumper, and started training endurance at the age of 23. At that time, he was in terrible shape, and had a VO2 max of around 40. After a few years with dedicated cycling training, he was able to double his numbers. At the current moment, he is 35 years old and is one of the greatest cyclists of the last decade. 
He is Olympic champion in time trial, has won grand tours, and has a VO2 max of around 90. If it was impossible to influence this parameter after the age of 20, then how the heck is this possible? There are many more examples as well, of people starting to train as adults and achieving dramatic cardiovascular fitness improvements. There exists no so-called window where VO2 max is more easily developed at a certain age. The heart is just a muscle that adapts to the stimulus you give it. It's not like the heart magically, between the age of 19 to 20 all sudden becomes unresponsive to training stimulus and can't adapt anymore. Well now you're 20 so I'm suddenly gonna shut down and stop responding to training. What the heck guys? When does the bicep then stop to respond to training would you guess when you're 22? What about the legs? Can you increase the cross-sectional area of your hamstring muscle after the age of 24? Oh no, the window for legs is between 18 and 24. This idea is just nonsense. This theory, which was invented by people in the skiing community without physiological knowledge, is just absolutely ridiculous and this stupid myth should disappear immediately. If you're far off your genetic potential, you can absolutely increase your VO2 max as an adult. Now to number one. Perhaps the number one stupidest idea in the skiing community. The ridiculous idea of, it's in the winter time your form should arrive, or he's too early in shape. For those of you who don't know, the theory is basically like this. Being in a good form during the summer and autumn is dangerous because you will be too early in shape. And by the time the winter comes, you suddenly can't sustain a good form anymore. Firstly, how do you define the term form? The form is in reality just the performance VO2, or the average oxygen consumption during the competition. The higher average oxygen consumption, the more power you'll be able to produce, because of the near-linear relationship between these two parameters. This term is synonymous to aerobic capacity. What you're interested in is having as high aerobic capacity as possible. Your aerobic capacity is a product of your VO2 max and the percentage of VO2 max. Even though the system is not static, it's still a product of those two factors. In the skiing community, there is this idea that this form is this magic thing that suddenly can pop out out of nowhere, just when the time is right. This is not the case at all. Your aerobic capacity is your aerobic capacity, and it can only be gradually improved through dedicated and consistent training over long periods. So this idea of trying to voluntarily be in a bad shape during the summer and autumn doesn't make any sense at all, from a physiological perspective. Your body doesn't know whether it's May, September, or February. It's physiologically impossible to be too early in shape. Your form is what your average oxygen consumption is, and it's just about how you can most effectively increase it. The period from May to November, which is the period where skiers are preparing for the winter, is in reality not a long time period to make changes, and every single day counts. You can't snap your fingers and increase the functional threshold power from 250 watts to 290 watts within four weeks in the late autumn. A drastic increase in the threshold power can only happen through gradual improvements, through systematic work throughout the whole period. So the stupidest part is this idea of trying to be in bad shape. But you also have this other closely related idea that is basically to avoid all high intensity training for the first five months of the preparation period to build a base and then suddenly start to do four to six weeks with a little bit of high intensity work in the late fall. This is a huge mistake. Training only the muscular endurance through zone one to zone three, without implementing any training to increase the maximal oxygen uptake for 80% of the whole time you have available to make a change is a ridiculous approach, which will just lead to a worse aerobic capacity in the end. The only reason why you might see a drastic increase in your capacity in the late autumn is only because you enter the fall in a worse condition where you're further away from your genetic potential, which leads to easier gains. You will not be able to catch up all the high intensity work you lost during spring and summer within just one to one and a half month in the late autumn. Training in the higher intensity ranges must be performed year around for maximum results. Think of it a bit as studying at a school. Are you really getting the best results if you're skipping the most essential part of the subject for the first 80% of the semester and then suddenly start to study like crazy right before the exam? It might work to a certain extent, but it's not ideal at all. Consistency is the king and systematic daily improvement is the only way to achieve the greatest potential performance in any field. 
So do not skip the real deal type of training during summer and convince yourself that I'm doing things right here because my form should suddenly and magically arrive out of nowhere at the perfect time right around Christmas, almost like Santa Claus and his reindeers. Endurance sports science isn't like fairy tales and mythology. This is about physiology and not about traditions and nonsense. Being lazy or training exclusively in zone one to zone three is a terrible approach, regardless of what time of the year. You won't find any tricks in the book. Improving the average speed is not about magic and trickery. The only way to achieve greatness is through systematic micro-improvements day after day, over long periods. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.